Okay, everybody. Um, I am sorry, I'm getting emails and people still having trouble popping on here. So um, I will just go ahead and start the show here. Um, my name is Casey Harriet. I am the R3 coordinator for ODWC and National Wild Turkey Federation. So essentially, I help to create programs and initiatives that help increase hunting participation and education uh, in the state of Oklahoma. And today we're going to be talking all about deer rifle hunting, which is the most anticipated season of the year. And I have um, Dallas Barber here, big game biologist, to uh, discuss and have a, we have a little presentation over it. And then um, we're going to go over some just basics. We're going to go over some firearm stuff and mm -hmm. uh, where to hunt regulations. And we also have our resident game warden, Jacob Harriet, on here. Um, I see him up in the corner there and he can ask, you guys can ask any questions. Um, as we go along, I just ask that you guys type them in the chat box and we should have a pretty good chunk of time at the end for question and answer. And, um, and I will field all those questions that have been left in the chat box. We have a decently big crowd. So if we were to just let you unmute yourselves, it would get kind of hectic. So <laughs> before we get started, I just, yeah, go ahead and type anything in the chat box as we go and I'll field them at the end. And I am going to share my screen here and hand it over to Dallas. Let's see. Oh, this was always the hard part because I have to go to this. And then there. Okay. Minimize this. Can I get an audible? I can see this on here. We can see it. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Good deal. Um, thanks again. My name is Dallas Barber. I'm our big game biologist for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. So essentially, I uh, manage all of our big game species kind of on a statewide level. So I'm in charge of our whitetail, mule deer, elk, and pronghorn species here in the state. But today we're going to talk a little bit about deer gun season. So the first thing that I kind of wanted to cover, um, just the basic kind of uh, terminology that that revolves around you know the modern firearm that most people are going to be carrying into the woods uh, this Saturday. So these are all of our parts of, of a you know modern bolt action rifle um, just starting from the back. We've got a butter recoil pad that feeds right into your stock and your grip. Um, all of that is kind of a, a support system that you put on your shoulder to uh, steady your rifle. Um, all of our modern firearms are going to have a safety mechanism of some sort on it, uh, you know, two-stage safety, three-stage safety, whichever one your rifle has, just make sure that you familiarize yourself with that and how it works. It is probably the most important piece of a rifle next to a trigger. Um, you can see that it shows a trigger down there on the bottom along with the trigger guard that's there to protect that trigger from any accidental fires. Um, you've got a bolt handle, a bolt, your ejection port where you're uh, either putting ammunition in or spent ammunition is coming out. You've got a receiver and a magazine floor plate. Um, this is showing a rifle that has an internal magazine. Some of the more modern rifles will have an external or a box magazine. Um, your forestock is going to be the, the portion that you're putting your hand on to support, and you've got a barrel and a muzzle. Again, just some basics to, to kind of understand what that is and why all of that works. Um, the most important thing is that you need to be comfortable with your rifle, um, how that weapon operates, um, understanding that and the safety mechanisms and the functions of that weapon. Um, probably square one is making sure that your rifle is zeroed. Um, so for those of you that have not done that yet, you've still got a couple days. You know, if you buy a rifle from the store and they say that they have bore sighted it for you, that does not mean that your rifle is sighted in. So select an ammunition that you feel comfortable with uh, that is chambered for the weapon that you have purchased or the weapon that you have on hand and make sure that you practice, practice, practice. That'll help you kind of understand what your limitations are as a shooter. That way we're not shooting at deer that are way too far away for what our capabilities or what our rifles capabilities are. So a little bit about our deer gun season dates. I get this question all the time of, you know, what day does, does rifle season start next year? Well, um, rifle season dates are set in Title 800. So every year, regardless of what the dates are, Deer gun is going to start the Saturday before Thanksgiving and run for 16 days. So with the way that the calendar falls this year, 
that's starting on November 18th and running through December the 3rd. Um, Hunter Orange, so this is, this is the non-negotiable and I'm sure Jacob will cover a little bit of it here, but all hunters participating in basically any gun season, any big game gun season, um, must wear both a head covering and an outer garment. So and is the big one there. You have to have a hat and a vest. Um, 400 square inches of hunter orange. I'm sure Jacob is not out there with a tape measure, but uh, let's make sure that we've got a front and back covering along with that hunter orange hat and you should be good to go. Um, just something to note, archery hunters during this time should also wear an orange head covering or a garment above the waistline. So archery hunters get an or, gun hunters have an and, just something to keep in mind. Again, guys, this is for your safety. Um, this is not something, we don't do this to make you have to remember something or to be able to catch you doing something that's against the rules. Um, this is for your own good. I don't think anybody here would care to, to receive a gunshot wound. I know I sure wouldn't, but uh, that hunter orange helps us uh, kind of mitigate those issues. Um, to talk a little bit about bag limits, deer gun bag limit is going to be four deer, um, no more than one of which can be antlered. So you can shoot any combination of four deer as long as only one of those are antlered. So you could shoot four does, you could shoot one buck and three does, or you could shoot one doe or two does or three does. So as long as you're not going over that individual bag limit, um, you can can harvest four deer with your rifle. Now, one thing to note is that for antlerless deer, um, your deer harvest is limited by whatever antlerless zone the area that you're hunting falls in. So the next slide is going to be a map that shows that, but I did want to go over this zone one, which is mainly that panhandle zone. I guess we can just skip right to this and we can go through it. Zone one is up here in the panhandle. Um, basically everything in that blue zone one is only going to have a one antlerless deer limit. Zones two, seven, and eight, which make up primarily most of north, central, western, and southwest Oklahoma, um, those zones combined, you can shoot your whole bag limit there, just full of antlerless deer. Um, three, four, five, six, and nine, which is northeast, central, east, central, and south central Oklahoma, um, are going to have a two antlerless deer bag limit. And then zone 10, southeastern Oklahoma, uh, that's going to have a one deer bag limit as well. How do they set those? So those are primarily set by population estimates. There's also some of them that are set by, um, you know, basic, not, I, political is not the right word, but when we established these deer zones, um, we had public hearings and the public hearings, obviously we take those into consideration for what the people that live and hunt there want to do. So for instance, that zone 10, that one deer down there um, was primarily driven by people's concern over the sheer amount of public land that's there. So they were worried about, uh, you know, over harvest based on just the sheer amount of public land that's their public opportunity. So here's the biggest thing that I get questions on. Um, where can I go deer hunt, right? If I want to go, where can I go? So this link right here brings us to our website. This is just wildlifedepartment.com. That's the department's website. If you click on hunting, hunting resources, and then scroll down just a little bit, it shows deer hunting. So we'll click on that. And this is kind of the home page for all things deer hunting. If you scroll down just a little bit, it says public land deer hunting opportunities. So we have set this up to where whatever method you're hunting with. So for this instance, we're going to click on gun. This gives us a breakout of all of our wildlife management areas that are open to gun season in some way, shape or form. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that with all of these, there are individual regulations that go with each one of these of these WMAs. So for instance, let's say that we want to look at, uh, let's do pack saddle. So pack saddle up in the Northwest part of the state, you click on that and it would bring you to the pack saddle page, right? So looking at this, you can scroll down just a little ways to, area specific hunting regulations. 
So this will show you those individual regulations that occur on Pack Saddle WMA. So one thing to note here, like if, for instance, Pack Saddle's got it set up where it's only open the first nine days and you can only harvest antlerless deer the last two days of that area season. So something to keep in mind there, you know, it might, it's gonna be different on any other WMA. So like if you were to wanna go to Call, which is up in the North Central part of the state, same exact thing. You can scroll down to those area specific hunting regulations and you can see that call is only open the first nine days. If you want to look at, you know, black kettle, each one of these WMAs we have set up their own page to where each individual WMA can show their specifics, right? So specific hunting regulations for black kettle deer gun first nine days only so it'll just depend on where you're wanting to go we'll show you each of those regulations so now i got to figure out how to get back to my presentation is it here no no so go back to the icon there and then you have to kind of like like right like wait for a second and i think it goes away so that's the part that's the part because i'll show you what, i know that's the inbox it's blocking our tabs up here. <laughs> I bet they probably can see that too. <laughs> You're just going back and forth. Stop with me for a second. I think, I think you have to. Um... <laughs> we can. I'm gonna stop sharing, <laughs> and then start back up sharing Sounds after good. I fix it because that is the most frustrating thing. I'm gonna go to our presentation first. There we go. Okay, and then technical difficulties. Okay. We're back. We're back. Can everybody see that still? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are things that should work. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we've so you know we've we've learned our rifle, we've sighted in our rifle, we've chosen where we want to go, and here are a couple of reasons for kind of why deer gun season is is a special time to be in the woods so obviously it's a lot more enjoyable to be in the woods when we've got some of these cooler temperatures as compared to you know early rifle season or i mean early archery season or that that earlier part of the year when we have muzzleloader season temperatures can still be hanging in the 90s sometimes so the cooler temperatures it's a heck of a lot more comfortable just to even be in the woods but from a biological standpoint it's also a great time um, that falling peak of the rut um, and post rut when rifle falls. So we have got a, a pretty substantial data set from our herd health evaluation where we're looking at fetal lengths that tell us when the peak rut is in our state. So the average of our peak rut is going to be from November 8th to November 12th. So that's why there is a gap in between the end of muzzleloader and the start of rifle every year is we're kind of protecting that peak rut time frame so deer can do their thing. However, you know, the peak of that is ending around the 12th. Well, there's still quite a bit of rut activity that falls after that peak. You know, it's, it's a big bell curve. So after that peak, um, we're starting to be able to hunt them with a rifle. So bucks are still going to be searching for some of those last remaining does. So you're still going to probably see a little bit of rut activity. Um, with that being said, things are kind of starting to go back to normal as far as, as patterning deer go. So, you know, during the rut, the, the rules are there are no rules. Everything you've learned about the deer in your area kind of goes out the window. It can be a pretty exciting time, but it can also be a frustrating time because everything you've done as far as your homework on your deer kind of goes out the window. But with that rifle season um, falling kind of into that post rut, a lot of these deer are going back into kind of recovery mode. So those food sources that you've traditionally seen deer on are, are going to really kind of ramp back up with activity. Um, those late season food sources can be a, a great place to, to start. So what are some of those? Um, some of those late season food sources, there's still going to be a little bit of natural browse that's remaining um, with some of the last kind of things that are remaining green. Obviously, we've had a pretty good cold snap before our rifle season here, so most of that has kind of dried up, um, but a lot of deer are still focusing on 
some of that last remaining uh, fall food source. Um, hard and soft mast. So our trees that are producing acorns um, are, are going to be our hard mast. Our soft mast can be things like um, persimmons would be a great example of those. So as those food sources mature and are starting to fall, most of our white oak trees have already let go of all their acorns. Our red oaks are going to be letting go of their acorns here soon. Um, so those are things that, that deer will kind of get back into. Um, and now agriculture is starting to play a major role. So for, for some of you that um, are in ag-centered areas of the state, which is most everyone except for the southeast, um, that's going to play a, a major role in, in deer and their food sources. So those winter wheat fields are going to kind of start to be a hotbed for activity. Again, I mean, a deer's nose is its best defense against predators. So even though that the ranges are extended with our gun seasons, you know, we've gone from, you know, an archery tackle, you're looking at, you know, 40 yards and in with a rifle, you know, I'm not going to really set a limit on what people should or shouldn't shoot deer at, but whatever you're comfortable with, it's a heck of a lot farther, farther than 40 yards with a rifle. Um, you're still gonna wanna stay downwind of those deer and suspected travel routes. So something to keep in mind. Um, shot placement, it's gonna be pretty much the same. You know, your basic anatomy of a deer, you've got the spinal column that runs all the way along the top and the back. You've got our big femur bone here, We're getting into our lower humeruses right here, that scapula, all those vitals, all those goodies sit right behind this rib cage right here. So that's what we're looking at as far as the anatomy. So what's that look like on a deer that's standing broadside? So you've got, you know, that crease that that arm, that front leg makes. Um, if you can just put those crosshairs right behind that crease, give it a good slow squeeze, that should be right in the money. But as far as what I have to present to you, that's really it. Um, I wanted to leave a lot of time for us to just ask questions. I know Jacob probably has some stuff. He's getting stretched out there in the <laughs> truck, getting ready for his presentation. Um, Jacob, I'm going to turn it over to you. If there's anything that you want to cover um, as far as, you know, things that you see a lot of during rifle season that maybe people should be mindful of. All right. Thanks, Dallas. Uh, I'm basically just going to kind of go through the regulations and touch on the big things. After I kind of go through that, that guides me. I'll kind of touch on some stuff that I've been running to already. Uh, so the best order to do this, I'll just kind of go like I'm going through a hunting situation. So the first thing you need to do is, is have a place to go. So make sure you have permission on whatever property that you're going to go hunt. Make sure you know the boundaries and uh, know where you're at, where you're going to be at. If there's people around you, I advise, you know, get to know the hunters around you. We're a community. We should work together on it. It's always good to know those guys. At that point, before you go hunting, you have to buy your licenses. So if you're a resident hunter, you have to have your annual hunting license, which is just a general hunting license. And then you have to have a gun license for each deer you attempt to harvest. So whatever you're going for. So if you just want to shoot a doe, all you have to have is a, a gun antlerless deer license. If you want to shoot a buck and doe, it's a gun antler and antlerless licenses, two separate licenses. You need those separate licenses for each deer and you have to buy those before you go hunting for that deer. So if I was to check you in the woods and all you had was your annual hunting license, but you didn't have any of your deer licenses, you'd be in violation of the law because you didn't have your hunting license with you. Uh, reporting of harvest. So I've run into this a lot this year. Uh, the first thing you're supposed to do when you shoot an animal, uh, a deer, or any big game animal is put a carcass tag on there. So a carcass tag can be anything. Uh, the wildlife department is selling carcass tags now that are, are pre-made that you just draw on with a Sharpie, but that is not your license. You, you have to have your a carcass tag. I use just duct tape and a Sharpie, but you have to attach your name, license number, time and date of harvest to that animal. First thing you do, if I check you and you do not have that on there, you're in violation of the law. So make sure you get your carcass tag on there. I'm usually pretty lenient in the field, but if I catch somebody driving around in the truck and they have an animal that's not tagged, uh, it's a little bit different. You'll probably get a ticket for that. Um, after you harvest that animal, you have 24 hours to uh, uh, check that animal in. So whenever you leave your hunting situation, you have 24 hours to check that animal in. At that point, you'll get your confirmation number. That confirmation number needs to stay with that animal until it gets to its place of final destination. 
So final destination is a place of consumption. So if you take it to a taxidermist, you need to have that confirmation number on it. When it gets to the taxidermist, you need to have that confirmation on number on it when it comes back from the taxidermist. So anywhere you're traveling with that deer that's not your house, you pretty much need to have that confirmation number on there. Uh, so don't headlight or spotlight. So the use of any sort of artificial light for deer hunting is completely illegal. Uh, I had a guy a few years ago that he claimed he had bad eyesight. So the last you know, few minutes of light, he would t had a flashlight on his bow and he would turn his flashlight on uh, during legal hunting hours. But you can't use that. You're using an artificial light that, that would be illegal for deer hunting. Uh, so I've run into this a ton now. So you cannot do uh, pig hunting at night or any sort of hunting at night during any deer gun firearm season. So that's use season, muzzleloader season, rifle season, or holiday antlerless. You cannot hunt pigs at night. Uh, if you need a permit, you can call your game warden and we can go give out a written permit if it's a big deal. That law is made to help out farmers that are having monetary loss from uh, pig, pig or coyote damage. I want to help my farmers out, but most of the time it's somebody just wanting to do it for fun. I uh, can't do it during the, the firearm seasons. Anyone who hunts during a big game season, so during deer rifle, say you wanted to go uh, coyote hunting and you took your rifle out there, you have to have a filled or unfilled uh, deer license. You can't, you have to have it since it is the season. Run into a lot of people that are just coyote hunting with their rattling antlers and their grunt tube and uh, so you got to be careful of that. Make sure you have those licenses. I think this is obvious, but you cannot hunt from a motor vehicle. I've had more and more issues with this. It's heating up this time of year. Uh, so don't be driving around shooting at your window. You're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble doing that. We already talked about landowner permission. Uh, you don't have to have written landowner permission for deer hunting, but it is a good idea. A text message actually counts is legally for written permission. So if you can get text message from that landowner, it's a good deal. A lot of folks in my county, I know who they are. I kind of know who's supposed to be there. Uh, occasionally I won't and I'll talk to them. I usually try to get to know that landowner and make sure they have permission to be there. Carrying your firearm, not a big deal during rifle season, uh, but uh, you do, you can carry your rifle of course. Uh, that's more for like archery season. You know, if you're bow hunting, you can't carry a rifle with you during archery season, but during rifle, you can have it with you, no problem. For rifle uh, specifications, uh, there is no caliber restriction. It is uh, at least a 55 grain soft nose or hollow point bullet from a center fired rifle is what is required. Um, there's no magazine restriction now. If you wanna hunt with a 50 round drum, by our law, it is legal to do at this point. Uh, you know, with ARs, it used to be a seven round limit for deer rifles. That's not there anymore. So if all you have is an AR with a 30 round mag, you're good to go. Make sure that you're using soft point or hollow nose bullets though that are at least 55 grain. I run into a lot of people using full metal jackets. Uh, that is basically like poking a pencil through an animal and it is not a humane way to hunt and you're probably not gonna recover the animal. Make sure you have that right ammo. It says it right on the box. Uh, selling of wildlife, you can't sell deer heads. Uh, you can't sell your deer. You can't even barter with them. So you can't say, hey, I'll go shoot this deer and give it to you if you let me hunt on your place. That's bartering. That's illegal. Shooting from a road. So you can't shoot from a road. That's pretty obvious. But also you cannot shoot across a roadway or the right of way of a road or a railroad. So think about that. A lot of these old railroads, uh, you know, it's about the only way you can see is down the railroad right away. It's illegal to shoot off of those. Uh, so suppressors are completely legal as long as they're legally acquired. You got to carry your uh, your tax stamp with you, though, if you're hunting with those. I'm all for uh, suppressors. I think they're great. I don't like to hunt with that one just because I like to hear. Uh, but make sure you have those tax stamps for those. Uh, transporting of your guns. You can have a magazine loaded. You're not supposed to have them chamber loaded. So make sure we keep that ammo out of the uh, out of the chamber. That's just a safety thing, though. I mean, just be smart with it. With crossbows, you cannot travel with those crossbows cocked. So you have to decock those before you drive. So just remember that. Uh, wanton waste, we run into this a lot. Uh, it is your responsibility after you harvest that animal to do your best to salvage all the meat and use that resource. We are out there being hunters. If you do this poorly, you're gonna get, you're gonna give a lot of anti-hunters fuel. We wanna make 
this look good. It, it is a great thing that we can harvest these natural resources and use them in a sustainable fashion, but we have to take care of it. And it's on each of us as a hunter to do that. So if you shoot an animal, get all the meat out of it, use as much as you can. Do not go dump your carcass uh, off the county road, dispose of it properly. There's nothing wrong with bagging it up in a trash can and putting it in your trash service. That is completely legal. Uh, if you have a, a good ditch or something a long ways from your property line that it's not gonna get drug out by animals and be a nuisance to people, then do that. I get hundreds of calls every year on people telling me that there's a poached deer and nine out of 10 times, uh, if it's off a county road, it's somebody has just dumped their deer carcass there. So don't do that. Uh, other than that, Hunter Orange, uh, Dallas did a good job covering. You have to have your hat and your vest uh, or any sort of lower garment, at least 400 square inches. Basically a vest and a hat is the minimum. Make sure it's blaze orange and not like an OSU orange or a Texas orange. It needs to be blaze orange. Uh, that's one ticket that I don't really cut any slack on. If you're not wearing your orange, you're probably gonna get a ticket. Uh, other than that, so, uh, shooting hours are 30 minutes before sunrise to 30 minutes after sunset and just get out there, enjoy the woods. Uh, our game warden numbers are in the phone. They're public knowledge. If you have a question, please contact us before you go out in the woods and break the law. I would much rather have that conversation beforehand and save you uh, a lot of uh, time, money, and heartache by breaking the law that you didn't know about than me checking you in the field and then having to educate you in the field. Uh, we'll get to questions at the end. I'm seeing some pop up, but I can't read them. That's really all I have. I'm happy to answer you guys' questions or however I can. So yeah, I think that is it for me. We'll start running through some of these here. Um, Tim asked, do you still need a deer license if you have a lifetime combo? So lifetime so combo is gonna cover all of your deer licenses. So you don't need to buy anything additional if you do have a lifetime combo, but it needs to be a combo. It can't be a lifetime fishing license. It needs to either be a lifetime hunting or a lifetime combo. He also asked, can you kill a buck in muzzleloader and one in deer gun? Yes. So deer gun is a separate bag limit from deer muzzleloader. So if you kill a buck during muzzleloader season with your muzzleloader and have done that, you can also harvest one with a gun. JK asked, what are the caliber restrictions? Jacob already covered that. I hope that he heard that. There are no caliber restrictions as long as it is a 55 grain bullet that is soft nose or hollow point and a center fire. Another on those licenses, Dallas, just to clarify. So there's a, a combination hunting and fishing lifetime license. There's also just a combination hunting and fishing license. It's like 50 some dollars. That does not cover your deer licenses. And oh, then we yeah. also have a five-year hunting license that does not cover your deer licenses. So That's there's good, always a good, good point to make. So here's one, Jacob, that I'm not sure that I know the answer on, but you might. Can you clarify the requirements for using a handgun for hunting deer? I know that in the past there was some barrel length restrictions. Do you know what those are off the top of your four, head? Four inch. Yeah, four inch minimum barrel length. Uh, the yeah. bullet is the same. So it still has to be a 55 grain hollow nose or soft point bullet, but it has to have at least a four inch barrel. Yep, yep. And then the last, let's see. Um, so Heather, this is, this is a good one. Can you shoot from a combine if running, is that considered a moving vehicle? I think the answer is yes. That is a yes. motor vehicle. Yes. Now, Here's a, a, a brain bender. If I, I can still hunt from my combine in my field using it as a blind as long as it is not running. Right? Yep. It, it is. Yep. You just can't use it to aid in your hunt. So yep. you can use it as a blind, but you can't have the heater running. You know, you can't, you basically just, it needs to be set in place a solid blind. And not on in any way, shape, or form. Okay, Justin asked, can you re-explain the confirmation number and how I were to get that after shooting a deer? Yeah, so Justin, whenever you hop onto your eCheck app, um, which is just on our Go Outdoors Oklahoma app that you, you every hunter should have that, I recommend it. Um, whenever you go through that eCheck process, at the end of it, when you hit submit, it's going to pop up and say something along the lines of like, you know, uh, congratulations, you know, you have successfully submitted your deer and then it will spit out a number. And usually it is going to be seven digits, 
um, but though that is your confirmation number. It'll also email whatever email you have on file with us with that same message that shows your confirmation number. So that confirmation number is incredibly important to have. You need to have that. Uh, I usually, after I harvest my deer, I have field tagged it like Jacob explained, whether that be on a fancy field tag or a piece of duct tape, whatever it is that you've chosen to use. Once I get that confirmation number, I will write that as well on my field tag. That way it's all in one place and it stays with the deer until its final destination. Also recommend Correction on that pistol up. or handgun link. There is now no barrel restriction on handguns. I, I remember it changing, but I couldn't remember what it had changed to. That was one of the yeah. recent rule change proposals that just went through. Yep. It used to be four, but now there's no barrel length. On that topic, be responsible though. I mean, don't, I do not recommend hunting with a little Derringer pistol. Yeah, that's what she just said. Yeah. Darn. Yeah. So Chris Brown asked the check in is through the app, correct? Yep. I yep. want to elaborate on the check in and okay. that confirmation number. A lot of times, because, you know, I have a healthy distrust of uh, technology. Mm -hmm. um, once that pulls up on your phone with that confirmation number, screenshot it. Yeah. Just screenshot it too. That's another just like insurance. I mean, a little bit more insurance for you once again mm -hmm. if you're out in the field if you can't get your phone to work later it's supposed to work out in the field without it but you yeah. know everything's supposed things to work happen. and things happen so. so i'm going through some of these um alan and juliana ask does holiday does holiday i'm guessing holiday antlerless require another tag if i already have a lifetime license no and for those of you that are here, J.D. Ridge is on here. He's one of our senior biologists uh, from the Northwest region. So don't think that don't think that that's just uh, somebody from the peanut gallery that's that's answering these questions. The guy uh, he knows what he is talking about. Jeff says the regs state handgun firing a single projectile. Does that mean a single shot handgun or all revolvers are legal? I think that that's just referring to the fact that it fires one at a time. So it can be, Correct. you know, it's a semi-auto. Like yes, it's basically I trying to get away from, for... from some of that, uh, the buckshot or the home defense rounds that some of these folks are getting into. Um, is the WMA list on the ODW website a complete list of all public land in the That's state or are there the parts of additional public lands not listed? The, so that is just WMAs that the ODWC man. I'm going to have to ask everybody to mute themselves. We got a couple of background noises. I think you can do mute like two or three. Or maybe. Can you mute me? Because I can't do it for my phone. Uh, possibly. Can you mute me? Because I, I can't do it for my phone. Yeah, I'm trying. Give me one second here. I figured out how to do this the other day. Um, I thought it was audio settings. You should be able to go in the top right of the picture and mute. It's because you're you're coming out like normally I can do it up there, but I'm not seeing her. Come on, participant. Okay, I, I've and got it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so back to Tucker's question about is the WMA list on the ODWC website a complete list of all public hunting land? The answer to that is no. Um, there are a lot of other public hunting land opportunities. Most of those are going to be offered through the Corps of Engineers. Um, so the Corps of Engineers website has a list and maps of all of those areas that are eligible for hunting. We do actually, if you were to go to that wildlifedepartment.com, go to hunting, and then there's a where to hunt tab yes we actually have our w link our, yeah we'll have our interactive wma map we'll have our olap wma or olap interactive map and then we will have a link to the core land yes. uh available to hunt too and that is you know, that stuff a lot of it's in the northeast or I think most of it's eastern yeah. oklahoma um shantry asks can you leave the internal organs on site after field dressing yes you can now I think that that comes with a little bit of a caveat, not necessarily a legal one, 
but uh as like just be considerate of that like if you harvest a deer out in the middle of a food plot that one that's on one of our wmas or you drag your deer to the road and field dress it there just toss that stuff in the bushes don't don't leave a big gut pile out for for other hunters to have to deal with uh jk not sure what that stands for but that's who posted it do you have to carry a physical license or can you use your phone to show if you're licensed jacob hop in on that one dude so your phone counts as carrying your physical license so legally you have to have proof of your license on your person that being a cell phone or a hard card it does not matter it all counts as physical having it carried we can look them up now but it's still legally it is required for you to have that information on you is that the same as like if you're using your app to show it or can you have a picture of it on your phone a screenshot will work as well uh the, the main thing is, is we have to be able to see that customer ID number. So if you have a screenshot of your customer ID number, we can look it up that way. Uh, but ideally you would have it either on the app or the hard card. Uh, next is another one for you because I'm not real familiar with some of our, I wouldn't say obscure licenses, but maybe less utilized licenses. Is the Stars and Stripes license project open to active duty members? If so, how do I apply? Um, I'll chime in real quick. The easiest way to get an answer for that is just to be call, call our licensing folks. I mean, give our, our headquarters a call and talk to those folks in licensing. They know they know those things back, forward, up, down, every which way. So, Jacob, unless you know that one, which I'm going to give you like a lot of brownie points if you do. I, I know a little bit about it. Uh, so that's off donations. So if there's money mm -hmm. there, they should be able to apply for that. I'm not sure on who exactly qualifies. Yeah. Uh, but but if you'll go to our like it's just under like purchase a license and then you can put in for that stars and stripes application and they would deny you or not deny you. I'm not 100% sure on what all standards you have to meet to qualify for that. Yeah. So the next question Bart if you're on here it says can you go over the CWD rules? I have a place literally 50 yards from where the CWD deer was found in East Moreland. Uh, how do we conduct hunts and what are the rules? I, we could go over that for like an hour. So I'm going to spare us a little bit of time there. But if you have questions, call our headquarters building and they can transfer you to me and I'll answer all the questions you could possibly ever ask about that stuff. Um, are lighted pins on archery equipment legal? Yes. Are there any precautions I should take related to Lyme disease risk associated with harvesting, dressing, or preparing and consuming venison? The only thing you can do for Lyme disease is a tick deterrent. So if by this time, most of our ticks have gone uh, to sleepy sleep for winter time, so not necessarily a huge concern. Um, if it is something that you're concerned with, uh, I would recommend getting some uh, permethrin-based tick deterrent and get sprayed down in that. Jose says, after this meeting, will I be able to get license? You can get this, you can get your deer licenses regardless of if you've been through this class or not. Um, it'll just depend on hunter safety classes if you've attended one of those or are gonna be operating under an apprentice license. Or if you're over 30. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you know how far back ODWC can look up hunters ed numbers? I took the course back in the 70s and have lost my card from all the moving over the years. Jacob, why don't you touch on hunter ed and the requirements so people are a little bit clear on like who needs it and who doesn't? Okay. So they should, if you've taken hunter ed in the state of Oklahoma, they should have record of that. Uh, sometimes crazy things happen and stuff slips through the cracks, but for the most part, uh, you should be able to call up to our uh, C&E division and they should be able to find that number for you. Uh, so hunter ed requirements, anyone who is under 31 years of age has to have hunter ed to hunt by themselves. So you cannot take hunter ed until you're 10 years old though. So from 10 to 31, you have to have your hunter ed to hunt by yourself. That being said, you can hunt without it. You just have to have an apprentice de designated license. I get a bajillion questions on this. When you go through, say you're wanting to buy uh, your son or daughter a hunting license, well, it's gonna ask them for their hunter ed number. If you don't have a hunter ed number, well, it, it asks you for it. And if you just scroll down like a half an inch, it will say apprentice designation. Click on that apprentice designation. And all that means is you're gonna be with someone who has been through hunter ed that's licensed, who's 18 or older, and they will be able to take immediate uh, control of that firearm at any point in time during the hunt. 
So that so, means that you can't drop your kid off at one blind and you hunt another one. You got to be sitting there with them. Correct. Yep. So the next question, and this is a really good one. Do you need permission to track a wounded deer on someone's private land? Yes. Yes, And the, absolutely. And even more so is they can tell you no. And they yes. can tell Jacob no. And if that's if that's where they stand, there's nothing we can do to, to retrieve that deer. Now, hopefully um, you have built a relationship with the people that are around you to where you kind of have an understanding on that stuff. Um, but they can tell you no. And if you call Jacob, he can talk to them um, and they can tell him no. So th those are some of the uh, the private land rights that, that exist here in the state of Oklahoma. Yeah, not only that. So say you, you hunt, and I encourage everybody not to hunt on the fence lines. Everybody seems to for some reason, but get off the fence lines. If you shoot an animal and it crosses their fence and you think, oh, well, it just crossed the fence. It's probably dead right there. If you hop over the fence to look for that animal, they can press charges on you for not only trespassing, but hunting without landowner consent. Uh, so that's a big deal. You don't want to do it. Uh, I started this by saying, I hope you guys know your neighboring landowners. Uh, when you shoot a deer and it runs on somebody's property, that's not the time to go meet them and try to figure out who they are. Uh, do that ahead of time. It'll save you a lot of trouble. If you call me and ask, if I know the person that the deer ran onto, I will help you out. But I, I honestly, I just don't have time to go and try to figure out who these landowners are because that would be all I did. Uh, and I'm not going to go track the animal for you just because I can go on their property. If they don't want you on there, you're kind of stuck. And in most cases, we don't have an issue that most of our landowners are pretty pro hunting, but occasionally, you know, you get some that are not. Uh, so you just have to be careful with that. The best thing you can do is practice good shot placement and get off the fence line though. Yep. Alan asks, I've had a lifetime combo for, well, just a long time. We're not going to age you out, Alan. Uh, we've <laughs> had a lifetime combo for a long time, but I don't see a customer number on my license. Where do I get it? So um, the best way to do that is going to be to get with our licensing section. And if you have not created a profile on our app, um, on our new Brant licensing system, they can walk you through that. And that's how it will migrate your lifetime license onto your account. So um, it should do that automatically. Mm -hmm. So it, if you have a lifetime, it should have already made you an account. You yeah. might have to update your information, but that lifetime license number is still valid. You can still put that on your carcass tags and stuff, but it is it is easier to use the customer ID number. So say you put that on your field tag, that lifetime license number, I would have to go through a lot of paperwork and books to figure out who you are on that. But if you have your customer ID number, I can just pop that in and it'll pull up all your information. Uh, so it is good just to go in and update those. But all you have to do is go to our licensing division, hit purchase license, and it's gonna ask you for your name, date of birth, and last four of your social, and type that in and it should pull up your account automatically, whether you've never made an account or not you should have one if not you know call your local warden or our licensing division we can help you out okay i do have one that i'll take um d asked if i've never hunted deer before is there a group outing for beginners and i hope this is a like hopefully this applies to a lot of people in this class so it's a good question to ask um so there's not a group of people that just is is ready to air is like created to take people out hunting. You, what I would suggest is um, you get plugged in with your local NGOs, your non-government organizations, your conservation organizations like Quell, Pheasant Forever, NWTF, um, which is National Wild Turkey Federation. Um, I, there's a new one out called Oklahoma Hunters and Anglers. So they're all these places um, have local chapters and they're just because they have turkey or deer or pheasant or, or quail in the name does not mean, you know, Ducks Unlimited, Delta Waterfowl does not mean that they just do that. Um, I, I can especially, um, or Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is another one. So um, I can definitely attest for NWTF specifically, since I work for them, um, they do everything. We, we hosted a big deer conference this July uh, or August, and, um, and we do a lot of other stuff. So my biggest suggestion is if your guys are new to hunting, I would find the conservation organization that most fits your your interests um, and, and what you're about. 
uh, and get plugged in at that local level. One, because you meet a lot of like-minded people. Two, because they have a lot of um, programs within their conservation organizations that are for new hunters specifically. And three, because the networking opportunities and camaraderie and um, possible mentorship opportunities that you could find within there and just meeting new friends that would gladly take you out and, and get you experienced um, and to teach you is, is a, like the, the easiest way to go about this. It is very, very hard to just find mentors that just sign up that aren't a part of conservation organizations. That's really our backbone of our R3 work is our conservation organizations that are built on volunteers that are just passionate about hunting. So I definitely suggest, and if, if you guys need help, help with that, getting plugged in, at a conservation organization, I, if you email me directly, I can tell you a list. You can tell me what you're interested in and I can kind of help kind of uh, ma match make for you there um, in, that, in that regard. So hopefully that answers your question. If you can elaborate if you need to. Or I was gonna say, he Heather asked kind of the same deal. I mean, I think everything that Casey talked about is gonna apply regardless of what age that is. Um, there, especially being a youth, there are probably more opportunities. Um, a lot of these conservation organizations are a lot more willing to take a brand new kid hunting than they are anybody else. That's just kind of- They all have youth hunting. Is, um, yeah. And we also have Oklahoma Youth Hunters Association, mm -hmm. or OHYP yeah. program, Youth Hunters program that takes uh, 100 or 200 kids out each year. Oh, um, wow a bunch um and that is that event already happened i think jacob was there actually at that hunt afterwards so it's a one-time event but a lot of these happen um earlier season um and it's usually associated with either youth uh youth we have a youth gun season so, so or, you know working around that weekend or as an archery like a crossbow event because arch um rifle is the biggest uh, the biggest season in our hunting seasons and so it's hard to find people that aren't out in the woods yeah. themselves they, they don't they don't want to give up their time yeah exactly it's and, and it's not just one event they do several of those across the state okay yeah. yes yes they do um the, i guess we're just the biggest one is here kind of where is that stroud it's not the biggest one they do a, they do a whole bunch of them that was just one of them okay i think i'm thinking of their they have an annual event too somewhere so i think maybe you're at a different one but um, anyways, yes, they have great, and that's a great connection. So like I said, shoot me a private email and I will get you connected with all those. That's kind of my specialty is kind of matchmaking for people and getting them plugged in in that, that uh, conservation organization that's going to best fit what you guys need. I'm just going through to see if there's anything that we didn't talk about. The crab boil. <laughs> I think they saw, I think, you know, they at the very him. beginning, Jeff's, Jeff just comments crab boil. And I think that he saw Casey's calendar whenever yeah, we, have a crab we were boil sharing. <laughs> so if you would share whenever that is, um, everybody will be happy to show up for that. Tyler says, if I own the land, do I need a tag? Uh, we'll be first year hunting. So not sure. Um, I'll touch a little bit and I'm sure Jacob's going to tell me about how wrong I am. So this is a test on, on what I know. Um, if you own the property, you do not need a hunting license, but you do need to obtain the deer hunting license for whatever method it is that you're hunting with. So if you're archery hunting, you're going to need to have a deer archery license. If you're muzzleloader hunting, you got to grab the deer muzzleloader antlered or antlerless license, whichever one you're chasing after. It's just you do not have to have a general hunting license for private land. How'd I do? That, that's perfect. And just to clarify a little bit more, I worked a case where this was the issue. Uh, it does it counts for the deed holding landowner it doesn't count for your kids so yeah. i had a a guy whose kid lives in california went back and hunted on his folks place i checked him he didn't have a license he said well this is my property well this is your dad's property it's not your property and he didn't have anything so he broke a lot of laws more than that but you it's for the deed holding landowner only yep so the next question is a great one. It said, I read about a program that you can donate excess meat to hungry families. Can you touch on that? Yes. Um, so that's called our Hunters Against Hunger program. And you can find that on our website. Um, if you just go up into the search bar and search Hunters Against Hunger, um, what that is, is we have collaborated with a lot of processors across the state. And there's a list of those that are on that little link. 
Um, and basically you go to that processor, you tell them that you want to donate that deer to Hunters Against Hunger. Um, usually there's a small fee uh, uh, that comes with it. It kind of depends on the processor. A lot of them are just requesting like a $10 donation that'll handle kind of the skinning fees and things like that. I'd recommend if you know that that's something you're interested in, call that processor first before you show up um, and ask them if there's any additional things that go with that. But other than that, it's, it's free to do. Um, another thing that we have is our deer share program, which is kind of, I would call it like a social media for venison given away, if that's what we want to mm -hmm. call it. So you can get on there and uh, you can kind of post like, hey, here's what I have or here's what I'm looking for. And you can get linked up there to, uh, to help. All of the stuff from Hunters Against Hunger goes to local food banks where it's then distributed to, uh, to folks that are, are needing that. Travis, if I'm out with a hunter, an older man, but not hunting. Okay, I'm going to try it. There's some, if I'm out with a hunter, an older man, but not hunting, I would be there to help him get around. Do I need a license? So if you're just, Jacob, I'm going to let you hit this one. Um, basically, the question says, if I'm out, like, let's say that I'm going out with my granddad. And he's the one that's hunting, but I'm just there to help him like drag the deer out and help him get into the blind and get around. Do I need a hunting license? If that is a legitimate what you're doing, no, it, it's just the guy that will be taking the deer. That being said, if I, the game warden, am watching you guys walk through the woods and you're carrying the gun and it looks to me like you're hunting, we will have to investigate that a little bit further. Uh, but no, if you're just helping your granddad get set up and everything and he's doing the shooting, technically you do not need a license. You still need to wear orange just for safety reasons, yep. uh, but you don't have to have your license. Usually if, you know, a lot, some common sense comes into that, but a lot of people will lie and try to cheat that system. Yep. Uh, so normally if there is one method of take, then one of them needs to have the license. But if I see you, you know, holding the gun, looking down the scope, aiming at deer, then uh probably gonna be gonna a little different conversation yes absolutely yeah. yeah so he says just to make sure he's carrying gun and i have orange on yep you're good travis um chris asks are there some are some places shotgun with slug only yes and that's why i showed you guys how to find those area specific regulations so i off the top of my head um, I want to say maybe Altus Lugert is a shotgun with slug only area. Fort Cobb is a shotgun with slug only area. But again, I want you to go to those places that show the individual regulations for those areas before you go in there. Um, obviously, if it's open to deer gun season, a shotgun with a slug is a legal method for take. So you can hunt with that on any of the WMAs that say, open to deer gun season with no additional regulations, but there are some areas that are just open to shotgun with slug. So I think also just to clarify even further, a lot of OLAP areas you'll see have archery shotgun only. Oh, yeah. And um, those areas are shotgun with no shot larger than BB. So a slug does not qualify for yep. Uh, yep. hunting on an OLAP property. That's the only thing you can do shotgun. deer wise on OLAP is archery. Yes, That's it. No if, ands, or buts. Um, Keith, so if I'm with my son and he's the only one hunting, do I need to wear blaze orange? By the letter of the law, no. But I think that it is pretty silly to not wear orange during any gun season at all. Oh, I thought Jacob just told the other guy to have orange on. Uh, I would have orange what he's on. Saying. I would wear it. If if you say, I don't know, if your son's over 31, he has his hunter safety and he can hunt without you, then technically you don't, but I would recommend it. But if he is hunting under an apprentice designation and you have to be a licensed hunter to hunt, you need to have that orange on legally. Oh. Uh, and I, I hate to be a, you know, a jerk about any of that, but when you have to work accidents where people are getting shot because they're not wearing hunter orange, it, uh, you don't take that lightly. So it's not there for, so I can see you easier. It's there to keep you guys alive. Uh, I would very much hate to have to go help your son out of the woods when his dad was just shot. Yep. So we're kind of wrapping up on an hour. Um, are there 
Is there anybody else that has any questions? Yeah, deer do not see the orange. So yeah. Don't worry about that being a deterrent for your hunting experience. Yes, and also we have a pretty cool video out, and I don't know if you can find it on YouTube still or not, but the difference in just solid blaze orange to camouflage blaze orange, it is amazing how much further you can see that through the woods. So I would recommend you, the camo blaze orange is completely legal, but the blaze orange is so much better as far as just keeping you safe. Uh, that Even that blaze orange with the camo on it, it blends in so much sooner than just solid blaze orange does. So Derek squeaked in one here. He says, so just to be sure, do I need a deer license in addition to my resident hunt fish license? So Jacob explained a little bit of that before. If you have a lifetime hunting and fishing combination, you do not need an additional deer license. But if you just have the annual hunt and fish license, um, yes, you do need to purchase an additional deer gun license. Okay, um, just oh, I want to well, touch before we wrap this up here, I want to touch on um, a new kind of uh, format we have where you guys can download or upload your harvest photos. It's called the tailgate. You go to the wildlifedepartment.com hunting, you go down to the tailgate and you submit your um, your photos there. But we would love to see uh, anybody that's harvesting a deer, um, especially after watching this class, uh, post post a photo of you and your deer. Um, this rifle season. So it's going to be a pretty big rifle season, but we have fun little comp not competitions, but like hashtags where, and it's on a reel. So you guys can get to see your photo. Up. Yeah. It's fun to see. It's kind of like a brag board or whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, you also can add comments on there. So you can tell me a little bit about your hunt. Tell me you watched this class. I would love to hear about that. Um, and also I just, when you do go to submit, make sure you have that Hunter Orange on or cause I cannot approve you. That's the biggest violation I have on there is a lot of people will go back and try to recover their deer and they'll take a, they'll find it, but they'll take a photo without their Hunter Orange on. And we just, we can't do that. And so make sure you have the appropriate Hunter Orange on and follow all of the submission guidelines before submitting it. But we would love to see that. Clean it up, don't yes. have it bloody. Yeah, no tongs. Um, there's one last question and this is the final, final one because I'm hungry and it's past <laughs> my lunch time. Heather says, do I need to have adult if you're 13 and have hunter education to hunt by yourself? Once you have hunter education, you're certified to hunt by yourself. There you so go. Quick and easy. If you're 13, you're good to go. Uh, but don't, go don't right think now. that just because you've been through hunter education that you're certified, to, that you're Ready. safely able to hunt by yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, you can definitely hunt with a parent if you're not comfortable. Don't just think because you have it that you can hunt by yourself and you know everything. Uh, it's mm -hmm. always better to hunt with a parent if you're not unsure of things, especially being that young. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you guys, all of our speakers. Uh, thank you, JD Ridge, for uh, kind of clean or yeah. answering some of our questions here when these get so long and can kind of get overwhelming. So we try to do our best to answer every question possible. If you guys have any more questions and want to get plugged in with a conservation organization, uh, please don't hesitate to holler at me. And yes, once again, thank you to our speakers, Dallas yeah. and Jacob. We really appreciate it. Good luck, everybody. Yes, good luck. Stay safe. Stay safe.